Thanks. So is code understandability important? Yes. Yay! Okay, I'm in the right room. Okay, that's great to hear everybody sort of say that. Um, I don't know, to me it's one of the most important things, right? I think, you know, when you look at the core things that we really expect of code, things like changeability and all these other things, so much of it really depends upon understandability, right? If you can understand something, you can change it, and then hopefully you change it in a way that it is yet again understandable, right? That's the basis of refactoring and everything else. The thing that's kind of rough about understandability, though, is kind of like, you know, trying to go and get a real grapple upon it, right? And I think um, particularly these days, it's like we are, there are so many different styles of programming that are out there, right? And we have been like, um, uh, you know, we're on this long continuum of going from like object orientation to functional and beyond. And, and um, some of the old advice we've had about understandability may not actually apply the way that it has in the past. Um, so this talk is really exploring that idea and kind of like trying to get a, a grapple on what understandability is as our style changes over time. So how many people here were for uh, Kevin's talk yesterday? Okay, he basically was talking about katas, right? And he had this... Um, just a series of examples of going and showing the same problem done in many, many different ways. And one of the things that kind of struck me with this is like, you know, just how, you know, how do we grade these things on understandability, right? It's like, you know, the Roman numeral kata using the replacement scheme that he had. It was like really a, a fascinating way of doing things, but you have that thing of like, gee, how understandable is this solution and how amenable is it to change in the, in the future as we go through and do things? Um, I think another thing about understandability, which is kind of tough for us, is that it's kind of like it's not just hard for us to get a grapple upon it, you know, ourselves, trying to look at code and figure out whether it appears to be understandable for us. But there's also the thing of like, um, you know, there's lots of people in the world that they want to have automated solutions for everything. And that's great because we're programmers, right? So we should be able to give people automated solutions for just about everything. Um, but trying to go and actually develop metrics around understandability, right? Um, there's an interesting paper, this one, Automatically Assessing Code Understandability, How Far Are We? And um, I think I'm just going to go and cut to the chase. Not very far, <laughs> right? Um, what the paper does is it goes and outlines a bunch of different mechanisms people use to gauge understandability, which is really kind of, you know, analogous to complexity, right? And looking at all these different measures and discovering that you could basically sort of score very high on all these measures or very low in terms of complexity and still end up with code that wasn't all that understandable. And um, just to throw it up on the screen, kind of like the, the thing that was kind of like the summary of everything, it's just kind of like encapsulated in this text here. Um, it's be kind of interesting to get your reaction as seasoned programmers to this um, particular argument. You know, look at that code inside the little grayed box there, right? So we have a client, async, async HTML, HTTP client, cookie manager, get the cookie, all these things. Then there's all this text which is going describing that even though this code looks understandable, it may not be understandable, right? And it could basically score very well on measures of understandability, but so much of it really comes down to what's the context, right? And I'm sure everybody here knows what a cookie manager is and all these other things, but they're kind of like assuming this tabula rasa that maybe somebody doesn't know about the domain all that well, and then they look at this code, and even though it you know, sort of like has a good deal of locality, meaningful names. Um, it's a very small snippet of code. It could still not be understandable by certain uh, measures that are accessible by automation. Um, so that's kind of strange too, right? It's kind of like, you know, people trying to go and arrive at heuristics for understandability. And then in the end of the day, we know that we're probably not going to be able to go and find any way of doing this automatically. It has to come down to uh, knowing what understandability is to us and trying to go and basically move forward with it. Um, you know, and the thing that was uh, very interesting I saw years ago, um, I saw um, a number of different things. This is like one example of them, talking about different ways of approaching understandability. And one of them was to go and actually use eye movement tracking software, right? So it's kind of like what they would do is take a bunch of programmers, show them a snippet of code, and watch how their eyes moved and trying to go and understand the code, right? And it seems like you ought to be able to discover something by doing that, right? So. If you have a piece of code, people are like scanning from the top to the bottom. They're going and scanning back and forth a number of times. Maybe that's more complex in, in what they're doing when they're trying to understand it. And the simpler things, you know, might have less eye movement and stuff along those lines. Um, Martin Odersky, who developed Scala, you know, basically at a, at a conference years ago, basically sort of pointed at this particular paper. And um, 
he was saying that in terms of understandability measured by eye movement, you know, it's really, it really correlates to the size of your program, okay? Or it's kind of almost constant in terms of um, the number of words or the number of pieces in the code that you happen to be going and assessing. And, you know, this is kind of like good for us in a way because it's like, you know, uh, wow, if we can write less code at a higher level of abstraction and make things more understandable at the same time, that's a win all overall, right? I mean, how many people like wordy, verbose code? Anybody? Yeah, I mean, it kind of, but isn't there a trade-off also, right? It's like between having code that's kind of like just speaking in English and going and telling you a story and narrative and stuff like this, and you can read it and understand what's going on versus the one-liner. And maybe the one-liner is kind of like cryptic in a way, too, and you don't know quite what to do about that. So we kind of live in this continuum space between code that is verbose, but it's like, yeah, I can scan it and understand what's going on with it, and then code that's like a one-liner that is, you know, it's like, oh, I kind of see what those symbols are, but what do they really mean? And then, you know, trying to go and understand things at a deeper level. Um, I know for myself, I really favor concision in programming. And um, it's been a constant tension for me to kind of go and say, gee, if I make my code brief, um, what am I losing in terms of understandability? And can we basically get the best of both worlds? Um, so I spent a lot of time writing code like this, right? So what does that do? It's pretty opaque, isn't it? Right? So for everybody that was in uh, Nat's talk yesterday where he talked about, um, uh, I think it was like uh, Donald Knuth basically had like a literate program, big literate program, and then there's like this <coughs> Unix pipeline that did exactly the same thing. It was really just about 15 symbols that were stretched over like four lines, and it did the same thing. But the question is really, you know, what's it really doing here, okay? Now, I'm assuming everybody here would know what flatten does, right? You know, it's kind of like flat, you know, flattening a list and stuff along those lines. Um, but code like this becomes understandable when you understand the operations involved, right? And I think that's really the challenge for us if we're going to basically move towards more concise, um, you know, expression, is to go and actually figure out what the vocabulary is. Can we have common vocabulary that we use in order to go and structure things? And how quick is it for us to go and actually adopt that vocabulary. Um, are there ways of writing this that would be easier for us to understand? Probably, right? Everybody kind of knows what a group by operation is? Seen this before? Some people have, that, some people haven't. It's quite common in functional programming. What it does is it basically goes and takes some criterion as a block, and then it goes and takes some collection, and it goes and says, let me break that collection into pieces such that um, every time that that block evaluates to a different value, all the things that, for each element, we put those into a separate collection. So it gives you a collection of collections that are all basically partitioned by the criterion that are given in the block. And again, that's a very high-level operation. It's common in many functional programming languages, and it gives you, it's almost like it's really easy once you have something like that to do histogramming and stuff along those lines. But once, you know, if you're not familiar with it, it looks strange. If you are familiar with it, you can kind of see what's going on piece by piece with it. But I agree, this is kind of a stretch, isn't it? Um, this is an interesting little thing I'd like to show. Um, what does this code do? Uh, yeah, right. It's kind of, kind of terse. Um, has anybody ever, heard of, anybody ever heard of like Markov chains at all? Okay, it's like this um, concept in mathematics. Um, when I first started programming, which is years and years ago, you can see the gray in my beard, right? Um, one of the things that I did was like try to find little toy problems before we even conceived a CODIS to go and just like try out programming techniques. And I remember reading about this thing. There was this program called Mark V. Cheney. And what it would do was actually go ahead and take like uh, some amount of text and then produce gibberish from it. And so this was before Twitter, right? Uh, but uh, no, what the idea was, it was really kind of interesting. What it would do is it would take like a big swath of text that you would go and pass to it. And what it would do is it would take for every word, it would basically go and find all the words that followed that particular word within that document. So if you have the word the, it's probably followed by 15 different words inside like a paragraph or something like that, or a couple paragraphs. And what it would do is it would pr produce like a weighting of the next successor and go and say, okay, well, the word the, um, the animal, right, basically that ha occurs 7 out of 15 times, so we can kind of weight things that way. And then what it would do is basically just pick some random word and then sort of like use a random number to go and actually say, look, let's go ahead and sort of like um, find a successor for this word that is basically statistically like what the, the previous text was like. 
So you end up having English that's produced when you're doing this that looks and kind of reads a bit like normal English, but it just doesn't really make much sense, right? So it's a fascin fascinating, very fun little program to go and write. Um, but you know, aside from what it does, I remember when I first wrote this, um, uh, I wrote it in C, and I didn't even have like linked lists or anything like that. I had to write my own data structures and everything. It was a big chunk of code like this to go and write this. And um, then later, using languages like Java, the amount of code becomes smaller. And then I discovered that basically as I started adopting a more functional style, I could essentially write the crux of the code pretty much in the first like four or five lines of this particular um, you know, snippet that you see here. Um, the way this thing works is I've got, this is Ruby code, there's a variable called rgaf, a global variable in um, Ruby, that basically goes and takes all of the command line arguments, assumes that they're files, opens them up and concatenates them all into one big piece of text, right? And then feeds that block of text into the program. And um, so rgaf read does that. And then what you do is you split that on word boundaries, so it's, that's what split does in Ruby. And then I do this um, operation called each cons, which takes each consecutive pair of words and sort of groups things by each consecutive pair. And then I do that group by operation that we were talking about earlier, which goes and says, let's go and group together um, each successive pair by frequency. And that's like the core data structure for going and doing this Markov chain computation. And there it is in like five lines of code. And it's because we're using higher level abstractions that you know just really weren't available when I first started programming, right? So we can do a lot more having all these different high-level operations, and it's really amazing. Um, and um, the thing about it that's a bit rough is that I'm sure that, you know, I'm guessing most everybody in the room needed that explanation of what, you know, the Markov chain algorithm was like to go and sort of start to parse this and understand what the hell is going on with it, right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, some of you are familiar with these operations in Ruby, some of you maybe don't see Ruby very often, um, but, you need to know the vocabulary, and then once you know the vocabulary, you've got a higher thing you can stand on to go and actually start to go and solve bigger problems. And you know, it's really much, you know, very handy for us to be able to go and move in that direction. Um, so I like writing code like this, you know, code which is very concise, but I recognize that there is this trade-off, and the trade-off is you've got to know the operations. And when you do know the operations, you have to be able to piece them together in order to go and, you know, understand what the hell is going on with things. Um, do you think we're going to get there? Is this going to be a common way of writing code? Yes. Yes? Yeah. And we're moving, you know, it's like it's kind of amazing. You look at what Rust is doing, you look at, you know, uh, reactive extensions, link, you know, all these different things, the use of enumerable within Ruby. Um, yeah, we are adopting this kind of style, but there is that trade off, isn't there, right? It's like you have to know the operations, you have to be able to know how to compose them, and then you kind of march off on with things. I sense a lot, of a lot of resistance to this, you know, across um, the industry, that people don't want to go this far. And it's interesting as well to go and just figure out what is too far, right? And then we're going to explore that a little bit here. So what language is this? Anybody know? APL? Anybody ever hear of APL at all? Yeah, okay, a couple of hands went up. Um, APL is a very interesting programming language, and um, it was diverse, first developed as a mathematics notation by a guy named Ken Iverson, um, and uh, back in the 1960s or 70s, I believe. And um, the reason people hated it, and still hate it to this day, is that it uses these really obscure characters, Greek characters, and just made up characters. And you know, back in the day when people were first programming with it, you had to use a special Anybody know what a typewriter is? They used to be used to, right, yeah. So it's like a special ball that you had to use that had the symbols you could go and use for writing an APL program, right? So if you're programming an APL, you had to have the special ball and then carry it around and pass it to the next person and, you know. Um, but still, even aside from like the physical, you know, uh, um, thing of going and doing that, understanding it was quite, quite bizarre. But the thing that was fascinating about APL is that you could basically do a lot in a very, very terse way. Um, wait, is that APL? No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this language. That must be really difficult. Wow. How many people know this language? How many billions of people work in this language every day, right? Isn't that kind of amazing? You know, and it's funny because I think we often have this thing of like, oh, 
can't go there. That's ridiculous. Nobody could ever really possibly ever do that, you know. Isn't it really a matter of acclimation more than like some inherent limitation of our, our uh, ability to understand things? So I think that is true. I think it really comes down to, I think we forget how often, we forget how far along we are, right? I think a great exercise for anybody is to take code that you work on today, bring it home to a family member that doesn't program, and watch them marvel at, you know, the craziness that you do. You know, it's kind of like, without knowing what a program does, or without having seen any like C drive language like Java or C Sharp or anything like that, it looks like complete gibberish and nonsense. Yet, you know, we swim in that stuff, don't we? I mean, so we just understand it. You know, immediately we just grok particular things that we're looking at, and that's kind of powerful. So, yeah, we can go further in this direction. Um, there's some more APL, just to terrify people. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do a little bit more terror right now. Um, what's that? Well, there's an APL drive language called J, okay? And that's when people realized that the thing that was worst about APL was using all those strange characters. They said, hey, let's do the same type of thing in ASCII, right? Um, so the J programming language uses only the ASCII character set and uh, none of those crazy symbols, but it allows the same kind of programming. And it also manages to find a couple of ways of making things a bit more complex. Um, but it does have some very interesting features. I want to kind of like, you know, walk you through a couple of these things. So this is one factorial. And what's one factorial? Just one, right? Okay. So what's the factorial of 345? Luckily, we don't have to know because that's not 345. That's just basically an array with 3, 4, and 5 in it. So we have a factorial of that ends up being this, right? So syntactically, we have the operator, and then we have, like, just a sequence, you know, a sequence of numbers that we can go and apply that to. Um, what's this about, okay? There's an operator in J called shape, and that's what the dollar sign is here. And it's basically used for imposing dimensionality upon data, right? So what we're doing here is we're saying we want to have a two by two matrix of ones. So we end up having that, like this here, right? So what other language do you do stuff like this in? What other language? Can you do this in Ruby? I've heard R has some interesting operators that allow you to do things like this. But the, you know, I love learning different languages because when you understand what the base ideas of certain other languages are, then you realize it's like, wow, you know, if we assume that certain um, data structuring operations are primitives and we can go and build upon those things, and quite often you end up with like, you know, a really very different set of operators that you can use for going and solving problems in extremely different ways. The function, the basic idea behind the APL derived languages is that uh, there's a different kind of polymorphism than, than what we're used to. And their kind of polymorphism, I don't even think they have a decent word for it. I've heard it called shape polymorphism, but then I've also heard that that means something different in type theory. But the idea is that essentially you have these operators, and for the most part, they are defined for all types of data, right? And what I mean by all types of data is that it doesn't matter whether it's a scalar, just like the one we saw before, or a vector like 3, 4, 5, or anything of any arbitrary dimension. It should still be able to perform that particular operation. So imagine having like a five-dimensional data structure, you know, like an array of five dimensions or, you know, five-dimensional blob in hyperspace, and you apply factorial to it. It will just go ahead and run through and do factorial on all of the individual pieces. But there are also operations that will basically sort of like, you know, uh, everybody's familiar with like the take and drop operations that occur within functional programming sometimes. If you have an array and you say take two elements, so just return the first two elements of the array, right? And that can be done in in uh, many different languages. But there's a take operation in J also, and essentially it's like saying, hey, take the first two elements. But if you happen to have like a, um, a vector, it'll return the first two scalar elements. If you have a matrix, it'll return the first two columns, or excuse me, the first two rows of the data structure. If you have a cube in, hyper s in, in space, it'll return the first two planes on the cube, right? So it's kind of like you just have these operations that just tend to work regardless of the dimensionality. And what's interesting about this is you end up having, finding very different ways of going and solving problems. So let's go in through and march through a couple of different things. Here's another shape operation. Two, three against one. We're shaping ones in the, um, in, uh, into a th two by three thing. And then here, essentially we're creating a cube with two on each face of ones. 
And the way this is kind of rendered out to the screen is just like, okay, it's like there's two planes of, you know, two by two, and it's like, if you squash them together, you see it's a cube in space. So, you know, you can't get more concise than this. Look at this thing here. This gives us a sequence of four elements starting from zero. Okay, so I dot four, so it goes zero, one, two, three. Okay, let's do a shape of two by two of that sequence, and notice what it does. It kind of like fills the first row, and then it goes and fills the second row. Okay. Um, two by three of one and two. So notice what happens when you get to the end of a sequence. It just starts going and repeating, right? Now, it's interesting about this. I think one of the things that comes up quite often for us when we're programming is this notion of like, what's the allowable domain for a function? It's kind of like, what are the edge cases when we're working on something, right? It's kind of like, how do I know, you know if I'm working with like a, a square root operation, I know that whatever I pass in has to be zero or above. If it's less than zero, it's not going to be defined, right? There's like um, a bias within this style of programming towards going and defining, having defined values for everything. So rather than going and saying, oh, we've only got two elements, zero and one, and you want to put it in this thing which is two by three, error, because, you know, there's only two elements. It just says, hey, let's repeat them. So it goes and gives you like this rich set of behaviors you can use to build upon and fewer error cases. Okay, so what about this? We want to have a 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 array of ones and zeros. How many dimensions is that? So it's like a six dimensional thing with 12 in each dimension. I don't, I don't even want to print that out. That's ridiculous, right? We'd probably end up spending days printing that out. So we're not going to do that, right? But this just shows the arbitrariness of this. We can basically go ahead and have an arbitrary number of dimensions working in this particular language. Um, here's another operation. Okay, notice I was saying before we have like one dot, you know, one dot six is going to give you the sequence zero to five. Um, the, uh, the plus sign and the dash, what it does is it's almost like a fold operation. So it's going to provide a summing operation across, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and if you sum that, that's 15, right? So let's do a little bit more. Okay, so here we're taking twos and we're putting them in the shape three by three, okay? And then what we do is we're going to apply this particular summing operation. What we're going to do is we're going to do it on each one of the, um, on each one of the columns. And what we do is we get the sum of 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, and it's, well, actually, no, t t twos, okay. So it's going to be, you know, a 3 by 3 matrix of twos. We're summing downward, and we're going to just have 6, 6, 6 as the result. So our fold is happening only one dimension at a time with this we can double up our fold and end up going and summing those 666s six, six, to 18, right? So is this like really composable? It's like way composable, right? We can compose all these operations together. And one of the reasons we can compose everything together is because just about everything has a defined value. And you get to sort of say, look, you know, here's, you know, I have this thing that has an arbitrary number of dimensions. I can apply this other operator to it and transform and transform and transform and get to the thing that I care about. Okay? Now this is a fun one, okay? This is an operator called grade up. And what this does is it goes and actually returns back the position that a particular the list of items would be if the list was sorted, okay? So, <laughs> which is kind of funny when you think about it. So we have two, five, one, zero, six, and essentially what it's saying is the thing in the third position, zero, one, two, three, is a zero. Um, if our list was sorted, then that would be the very first element, right? And the two that comes next, okay, essentially it's saying the thing in the second position, zero, one, two, um, which is the one that's up there, would be in the next position in the sorted list. Why would anybody have an operation like that? That's kind of bizarre, isn't it? Who would think to do something like that, right? Crazy mathematicians in the 60s, of course, right? That's just what happens, right? Um, but the thing is that what's interesting about grade up is that it allows you to do something like this. Notice that there's a tilde after the grade up operation in J here. What this is doing, it's kind of fascinating. In APL, what you've been seeing so far is almost like we have operator and then it's working on data, operator working on data. It's almost like a prefix type operation. And those are called monadic operations. There's also dyadic operations, which is that you have a left, and then you, a left value, an operator, and then a right value. And um, what this tilde does is it basically says, take what we have on the right hand side, put that data on the left hand side also and treat it like a dyadic operation. 
And most every operation that you have is, um, it has both a dyadic meaning and a monadic meaning, okay? So when we looked at this up here, okay, this grade up operation, when we're using it this way, operator and then data, it goes and gives you the position of each one of those things, okay, um, in the sorted array. If we took that same thing, the 25106, we put it in front of the operator and after the operator, what that's going to do is it's going to go and say, okay, what I want to do is actually take all the, the things we have on the right-hand side, put them in the positions that we have in the, um, uh, I'm sorry, take all the things we have on the left-hand side, put them in the positions that we would have after the grade up operation is applied to those things. And I'll show you that. I'm not explaining it very well. Um, it'd be like this. What we're going to do is we're going to, we, <laughs> we end up applying that operation to the stuff, and then we put it on the left-hand side, and then what we end up doing is actually having the sorted list that comes out of it. So it's kind of like applying the operator monadically and then basically putting that result on the left-hand side and then going and using that to go and determine the positions you would go and place all the operations happen to be. So here, the upshot of this is that essentially they found something more primitive than a sort, which is determining the position that something should be in a sorted sequence, and then set it up so that sorting was actually a transformation on this operation, this grade up operation. Why would you do this, right? And I think that the thing that it really comes down to was that they were trying to go and basically decompose complex operations into simpler operations. These simpler operations can be composed to go and produce other operations as well, right? Is anybody's brain stretched at this point? It is kind of stretchy, isn't it? Isn't it fun? You know, to kind of like try to imagine for me, I'm, for me, I'm jet lagged, so it's like ah, I'm a little bit fuzzy right now. Anyway, um, so yeah, I hopefully I've terrified you a bit with this. Um, this is the ultimate in terror, right? <laughs> this is the J program for doing Conway's life, okay? Does everybody kind of know what Conway's life is? Raise your hand if you know what Conway's life is, right? Okay, most everybody does. That's great. So it's a really interesting cellular autom autom automata system. And um, you have like a grid, you have cells that are alive or dead. All the black cells here happen to be live cells. And what happens is there's an algorithm that runs against the grid, and every time that it runs, it produces a new sequence. And you have these things that kind of like move over time and look like they're alive, right? Now, the thing is, the traditional way to go and actually um, program this is to look at every cell in the grid and say, look, let me look at all the neighbors of this cell and um, perform a calculation. That calculation is going to tell me um, whether that particular cell should be alive or dead in the next iteration. And that's the typical algorithm for this sort of thing. Um, and that's what the code looks like it's doing, right? <laughs> okay. So... I'll be honest with you, I don't understand this. I really don't, okay? But the thing is, I saw a great video online that basically shows how the algorithm in APL works to go and do this, which is an APL is like the parent language of J. And it's utterly fascinating, and I think it's just one of the things that I think is so beautiful in programming. Um, the way they did things was th like this, okay? It's kind of hard to see here. This is the original thing they had from the video. Um, but you can see the ones there to indicate live cells and the zeros to indicate dead cells and stuff like that. The square that we have in the very center is the one that we're trying to perform an operation upon. We're trying to go and sort of like operate on that particular, you know, um, life universe. And from that life universe, determine what the next life universe is going to look like. So here's the thing that's kind of fun. In APL, there's an operation that allows you to take a data set and shift it. And what I mean by shift it, it's not like shifting bits. It's kind of like, you know, when you shift a bit, it's like the bit that's on the end just kind of disappears, right? But the shift that we have here is more like a rotate. It's kind of like you shift, whatever was on the end goes and get wraps around to the other side, right? So you have this shift operation, and as I mentioned earlier, with a lot of these APL operations, it's like it doesn't matter what the dimensionality of the data happens to be. So if we have a two by two grid and we shift it to the right, it's gonna kind of like move everything over and then put the last row moved over to that side, right? Um, so here's the thing, we take that center grid that we have here, and what we do is we shift it up, and that's what the grid above it is, we, take, we shift it downward, that's where the grid below it is. And you'll see in each one of those things, we're shifting in all eight different directions from this particular grid that we have there. And um, the way you determine whether a cell is live or dead in the next iteration, if you remember from the algorithm of Conway's life, is that you're counting the number of neighbors that are alive. And based upon that number, you determine whether you're going to be alive or dead in the next iteration. So here's what you do conceptually when you're calculating this in APL. You take that grid, you've shifted in all eight different directions. You take those nine grids that we have here, and you stack them up and sum downward at each point. And that sum that you have downward is roughly the neighborhood count. And then based upon that, you determine what you're going to do next. Now, who here has actually ever thought of doing things that way in Conway's life, 
right? It seems like, you know, Martians are walking on the earth now, and they would just never, you would never imagine to do something like this, right? Um, but this is the thing I find so beautiful about this, is that essentially, when you have these different higher level operations, they, prevent, they provide to you different ways of conceptualizing your problem. And these different ways of conceptualizing your problem often lead to different solutions. And quite often those solutions can be wonderfully concise. Now, so, you know, that again, it's like I don't want to go there. I don't want to <laughs> try to go and parse that or, you know, basically try to understand code that's um, been written this way, you know, using such a cryptic character set. But there's nothing that doesn't say that we can't go and have those kinds of operations with nice English names and compose things together and just kind of move further and further in this realm of being able to go and have higher level operations to do our work. And I think that's pretty much the direction that we are going with a lot of things. Um, and so, you know, we're back to this, right? Essentially, we are going to end up having more and more complex or higher level operations to make our code simpler and simpler. But programming is probably going to end up looking a bit different than what it looks like today. Now, having said this, you know, I kind of painted this, you know, terrifying, beautiful future, you know, where it's kind of like you get to look at, you know, code that does all these hyper-dimensional things to go and solve problems and stuff along those lines. Is that going to work everywhere? You know, even if we start to advance our powers of understanding, you know, and write more concise code, um, I don't think we're actually going to ever get in a, a great place because of this. And I think it really comes down to um, basic matters of expressiveness and also just like uh, a fundamental issue with the way that a lot of problems shake out in a way, you know, the way that we sort of like deal with certain problems in programming. Um, to kind of like illustrate this, I want to go and sort of like show you another little problem which seems very simple. Suppose I want to go and write code to print a polynomial, okay, and here we're using the char character to go and indic indicate exponenti exponentiation, right? Um, it seems like it should be relatively easy to go and actually write code that's going to go and print out an expression like this, especially if you're given something like, um, you know, the list of the coefficients, okay? This might be a decent input representation. So you can see here that what we're going to do is like we're going to treat the um, the exponents positionally, okay, and have an array there. What we would do is say, okay, look, first one is going to be the coefficient five, and since we have a four-element array, um, excuse me, a, a five-element array, that's going to be the exponent, the fourth exponent is going to have a coefficient of five. The third is going to have three. We have a zero there to indicate that we have no x squared term. And then we have a one for the x because that would be the coefficient of x. And then we have four for the final, you know, um, x to the zeroth value that we have there. So that seems like a decent input representation. Yeah, so let's write code to do this. What's it going to look like? Well, if we start thinking about how to do this traditionally, you know, um, one of the things we might think is that we can just kind of like march through that array. You know, that's, after all, that's what you just do is you march through arrays. And then um, perform an operation at each iteration here to go and actually build up the term that we need for that particular piece. Seems like a decent thing to do? Yeah, we can, except we're going to start to encounter some edge cases now. Um, you know, what about negatives, right? What about the, the sign that we have between the numbers? Is that part of each one of the terms or not? It's kind of a funny thing to go and ask ourselves. Should we, the thing that we have inside the loop, should it basically contain the leading, you know, plus or minus? What would that look like? Um, beyond that, it's like we also have, you know, uh, the issue of, you know, what do we do about, like, say, you know, the last term? Suppose that's a zero. And we don't have to print anything at all if we have, like, plus zero at the end. That would be kind of like a, a very odd representation. So we have, like, all these little edge cases. And it's, you know, very typical of the kind of thing that we have with, like, di various different katas, where it's like, you know, bowling, for instance, is just full of edge cases. So you end up going and producing more complexity in your solution than you might want to go and have. So, you know, one thing we might go and say is, look, let's go and structure our code this way. Let's go and say, we'll deal with the first term by itself, then we'll have a loop for everything but the first and the last term. And we'll deal with the last term. We can deal with special cases that way. So, you know, it seems like it's a decent thing for us to be able to do. Um, I think a, a way of going and approaching this is to go and say, look, let's go and just try to force it. Let's go ahead and say, instead of going and having like a, a loop for the center and then dealing with the first and second, third uh, term separately, let's try to force it all into just like doing our loop here. But we can get rid of the looping in s itself by going and actually starting to go and structure things using more of this kind of, com you know, functional style. Um, so, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to build up a list of the exponents that we have based upon the um, coefficients that we have. Um, so, I'm going from uh, zero to the number of coefficients minus one. That's a range. Turning that into an array and then reversing it. So, if I have like 
uh, five element array, it's going to be just like four, five, three, two, one, zero. And um, that, those will be the exponents that I use. Then I'm going to take the exponents and zip them against the coefficients that I have, right? I'll end up having a pair where I'm going to have like the coefficient and then the exponent. We'll have pairs of those things going forward, you know, for everything. And then if we take that and we perform a mapping operation to the term, then we can go and have like a list of the terms that we're going to have, and then we have to do something with those terms in order to go and actually produce the printable representation. So my assumption here is that we can sort of like build the outer shell of the program and deal with all those crazy edge cases, you know, just in the center, you know, by, on the, at the term level. So that's what we'd end up having as a representation doing this. Um, then you write term, and it ends up looking like this. Yay, we're done, right? But are we? Well, first off, it looks ridiculous, right? We want to go and have something which goes and expresses things a bit better. And also, there are edge cases that we're missing with this, right? Um, it doesn't really explain the algorithm very well. It doesn't include negative coefficients. It doesn't handle the zero coefficient case and all this sort of thing. So we're pushing all that complexity down to the term level. But we have to have some way of going and managing that complexity. One thing we can do is we can say, look, let's go ahead and sort of perform a little bit more abstraction here. Let's go ahead and say that a term is going to be a coefficient expression, and the plus is like string concatenation here. A variable expression plus the exponent expression. So we're able to build up those three, three strings, concatenate them together, and then perform, get, actually get the term. So we can do that. Um, the only thing about it, though, is that there are certain things that we simply can't cover. So suppose we have a case where we have a zero coefficient. We simply don't want to have that term at all. So we can go back to our original algorithm here and say, look, let's just go ahead and reject all the, the tuples that we have there that basically have zero coefficients. So they won't become part of the output. So we can't really deal with that at the term level. We're dealing with it at the expression level, the higher level expression level. Isn't that kind of weird? We're trying to go and deal with everything at the term level. We're pushing all the complexity down, but we still have to go and deal with the complexity at the higher level also. And so it's like we have a mixed, a mixed message there when we're doing it. Um, so yeah, we can kind of march in that direction. Uh, what we can do also is we can actually start to go and really, you know, start to get the finishing touches on this. Um, we reject all those zero coefficient terms. And then we perform a flat map operation where we have this special thing called sign term, which goes and sort of like applies a sign to the term, as we have the plus or the minus, based upon the coefficient that we happen to have. And then we join everything together with spaces between them. And um, our sign term would look something like this. We're going to say we have our term operation. We're going to return back a, a tuple, right? We're basically going to have a, you know, either a leading plus sign or minus sign, depending upon what the coefficient happens to be. Um, and then we can do, take those tuples and flat map them together and then actually join things together. Um, I don't know how you feel about this solution. Is it expressive? We're mixing complexity between things that happen at the collection level and things that happen at the term level. And I think a lot of the reason why we're doing this sort of thing is because this is a hairy problem. It's kind of a crazy problem. This is not as nice as Conway's life, right? And this is a, an odd space that we get into when we try to go and actually adopt higher level operations and be far more concise about the code that we're doing. If we have problems with lots of crazy edge conditions, we can't go all the way that way. Okay, we can try to go and start to approximate it, but we end up going like mixing different levels of abstraction, stuff like that, purely because of the problem itself, which is kind of sad in a way. Um, so yeah, we can end up with a solution this way, but it's like, I don't know, you know, should we go back to what we had before? You know? um, yeah, I think that's the thing I want to kind of like bring across with this stuff, is that you know, there, there's all these different things we can do to kind of make things more understandable, but we have to go and deal with, um, with the shape that we're going in, sort of like imposing upon the code. If we're trying to get more concise about things and make things more understandable that way, we still have lots of trade-offs when we start to deal with the edge cases. They're quite often part of the problem that we're trying to go and solve. Um, so yeah, we're always going to have these edge cases, and that's kind of unfortunate. Um, but I, I think in general, when I'm looking at understandability in code these days, I think that the main principle I'm trying to go and sort of like work with is trying to favor locality as much as possible. It's like if there is, if there's something I'm trying to understand, I want it to be basically immediate and within my field of vision. Okay, I want it to be something which doesn't go and call reference to something which is outside my scope. And a lot of functional programming allows you to go and get very, very local about the stuff that you happen to do, unless we run into those odd cases where we're, you know, um, uh, where things are, uh, you know, kind of mixed because of the problem that we're trying to solve. 
if you remember this from the very beginning of the presentation, it's like, you know, uh, we couldn't find a decent measure of complexity for this because, um, you know, a lot of the complexity there comes from external references to things that are part of our domain. The cool thing about going and trying to deal with this more structural, fun uh, structural functional style of programming is that things become massively more local, but then you have to really, again, understand the operations that you're dealing with. Um, but, you know, in addition to going and actually dealing with locality, you know, by going and using these concatenative operations, what we're able to do is avoid tangling our code together in odd ways also. The typical thing that we're used to doing where we have like blocks and ifs and fors and stuff like that, it's very easy for us to go and just add random things inside our blocks. And then you're doing two things inside the block. Or you're basically going and like accessing something from an outer scope and all this other stuff. And the more we kind of like get these concise operations that we plug together, we, the more we, again, favor locality and avoid possibly tangling things together in bad ways. So, yeah, I think we, um, you know, we will get more acclimated to this style of programming. Um, and it's going to require us understanding higher level operations a bit more and then kind of like trying to push things far more locally when we're trying to go and solve things. Um, but, uh, I don't know, I guess the thing I just wanted to go and sort of get across is that uh, I think that our notions of understandability are probably going to be changing over time a bit. And that's a good thing, you know. And, uh, you know, when people on your team go and say, oh, you're writing this very terse thing, you know, a good question to go and ask them is like, do you understand the operations? And if they do understand the operations, okay, just get used to it. If you don't, learn the operations. And then you're able to go and actually build things at higher level of abstractions that have um, far more composability. And uh, understandability comes with acclimation. So, uh, any questions at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it, you realize that there are so many in, like, uh, inherent for loops and all of the mapping, uh, joining uh, vectors, arrays together, and so on, that it's not really touching the brain. So. Well, yeah, I think that's true to a degree, but to a degree we're actually using common operations like transpose and map and join, things that we should understand. We don't have to go inside them. It's very much the trade-off we, we have with all abstraction. If you understand the abstraction, that's great. I think what I was getting across with that polynomial example is that there's this thing of if you try to push down a lot of complexity, like saying to the term operation, that has like lots of edginess, that's the place that you know, I think things fall apart, where you, know, you have almost like a leaky abstraction around something like that that doesn't really fit into this scheme. But um, I think it's really worth, you know, in the cases where we can hide things, uh, to go in, the, in this style of that. Does it kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm saying it's not universally applicable. Yeah, so, yeah. Other thoughts, questions? One on that side? I, I, guess it's, I guess it's more of a comment is, uh, in, in my past experience, I noticed things get fairly complex over time, especially, especially when they deal with uh, cross-cutting concerns, mm -hmm. hence security, logging, and other side effects. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on that based on this. Well, we have monads for that. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, and by, I think that is an issue. And it's like, I, I don't think anything like this is completely, you know, proven out. You know, I think, um, yeah, it, it really depends on how cross-cutting some of these concerns are and what you can actually do. There's, most every language has some mechanism for going and actually hiding some of these things behind other things. Uh, my understanding is in Scala, they're doing a lot around this, like the free monad stuff is kind of fascinating in this area. You know, I just I want to offer one other thing too. It's like Steve Freeman's going to be giving a talk, you know, using Go as an example next. And it's amazing that in Go they basically said, you know, none of, none of this nonsense. You're going to write some loops, damn it, because we want you to understand your code, right? So it's kind of funny. This isn't uniform across the industry. There are a lot of places where people are saying, we don't have to go this far, and damn it, we won't. So, yeah. I'm just curious if you'd considered, I mean, I'm coming from an OO school generally. I, I know I do some functional, but not a whole heck of a lot. You express this problem of like, what do I do about the leading, the leading, you know, negative sign? How yeah. do I handle that? And what are, coming from the old school, I thought, well, it's not really the responsibility of a term. Maybe there's a high level of abstraction. There's an expression, so I'm going to go through the loop. I'm going to construct a series of terms. I'll add the terms to the expression. The terms will have some sense of printing. The expression will handle the leading cases. Mm -hmm. Is there any like value to this? We're sort of discussing understandability, and, and I think, you know, when I'm thinking in this mode of thought, maybe it's just, you know, my education, where I come from, and the things that I know, the things I'm comfortable with. 
but they they do map onto the onto the mathematical you know terms. There's mm -hmm. a term. There's a term has an expression. These various levels have various responsibilities. So I, I don't know. I just wanted no, you to comment on that. No, it's perfectly fine. Actually, you know, I, I didn't really just for lack of time. I I introduced a term class here, and I think you may have seen this way passed through the code. I was uh, having a term class, but having an expression class is a valuable thing also. Um, so yeah, you can move in a more domainish direction to go and deal with these these edge cases, and that's a perfectly valid way of going. I think the main thing I wanted to go and get across with the printing example was just that, you know, you have things like this and like the bowling kata and stuff like that where your abstractions aren't necessarily clean and then you've got lots of choices. And uh, that's where some of these things kind of break down. So we're, and we are going to have to deal with that kind of thing. I think there's a big distinction between things that are far more mathematical in programming and also things which are, you know, very much, you know, human driven, you know, like tax programs and stuff like that where you're dealing with the vagaries of what people want and regulation and what just people want in general. And those, those kind of edge cases often make our code far more complex than it needs to be, and we have to go and move in those directions. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you're um, teaching a, a brand new novice programmer, do you think you should um, throw them into the sort of the higher level abstractions uh, straight away or teach the, the primitive basics first? Uh, well, these days I think higher level operations, I don't know, it's like everybody, how many people know the history of this, but structure and interpretation of computer programs. So, famous book that was used as MIT, you know, at MIT to go and teach programming, leapt right into Scheme and basically sort of like through the first five or six chapters didn't even introduce assignment. So it's a very functional style of going and teaching computation. And then at MIT they decided to kind of like scrap that because they felt that the future was everybody writing uh, code in languages like Python we just glued together existing libraries. So they kind of like um, moved away from this kind of like abstraction first, you know, mathematical, you know, programming first. Um, I think we, I, I kind of hope that we go back there. I think that there's benefit to knowing what the higher level operations are and kind of like whenever you encounter a problem, can we actually go and approach them with the higher level operations first and only start to incur the cost of complexity when we, when we deal with edge cases that we can't deal with at the higher levels. Um, I think that that's probably a, a better avenue towards getting towards simpler code. You know, get people to think about things in, the, in terms of these other abstractions and only go down into the weeds when you need to. So. Um, yeah, I haven't tried to teach somebody how to go and program this way first, but I think it's probably worthwhile, you know, yeah. So. Uh, any other questions, comments? Yeah. I guess I sorry, I can just... Have an comment. Um, oh, sorry. So, um, well, I think two, two related comments maybe. So structure and interpretation of computer programs mm -hmm. was scrapped because the didactic approach never worked. Right? And there's great didactic approaches that work with functional programming. Um, the what kind of approach? That there's great didactic approaches that are different from the one used in structure and interpretation of computers uh, programs yeah. uh, that work with functional programming. So it's a great approach to teaching. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research on why that works and, and yeah. how, how, to, how to make that work. So it's just that particular book is a great book. It's just not a great book for teaching. Yeah. Um, I think there's a misconception that I, uh, you know, us older folks, mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, is that the simpler steps or whatever that make up programming or, or that, that somehow, you know, the, what, what goes on underneath is somehow simple, right? Yeah. Um, because, I mean, we're, I mean, we, you probably grew up programming in C and we always <laughs> used to have this mind, you know, in our mind we used to have this map from C operations to assembly yep. programs. And I think this analogy stopped being true, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we now know that, the, I mean, there's great difficulty describing, I mean, even if a, in a language that has where individual statements seem simple to us, like C, mm -hmm. right? Um, we now know that, there, I mean, the C Standards Committee has having great, is having great difficulty describing what these things mean, right? And yep. there's a lot of issues that have to do with undefined behavior. So mm -hmm. I think that's a complete misconception, is that somehow the imperative steps-oriented programming uh, is somehow More the steps are well. I mean, we can argue about natural about whether it's natural or not. But it's definitely not. Si but it's definitely not simple. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Fair enough. So simplicity is not the right axis along which to describe it. And our intuitions about what the steps then actually de do, especially in the presence of concurrency and things like that, yeah. are often wrong. Mm -hmm. And our intuitions about things like that mm -hmm. are usually right. And that's yeah, a great. Yeah. Fair enough. Set. Because these are far more right. well defined, yeah. and they are basically. It seems like when you adopt something like in a very pure, you know, so you're seeing all, there are no side effects or you're yeah, working yeah, to avoid exactly. all those things. So far more conceptually amenable. But um, I remember like trying to do it, you know, how would I do a histogram in functional programming? I was like completely stumped until somebody showed me group by. And I'm like, yeah. okay, now I see it, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think having these higher level building blocks is just the direction to go in. Uh, but, 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 I, but that's because yeah. you grew up wrong, right? Like I did. Yeah, right? fair enough. Um, so. <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll give you that. Okay. Any other? I see it. Any other questions, comments? Are we set for time? I think we're probably, unless there's a very quick last question. No? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.